Hello. Thank you again for joining us <coughs> in this wonderful series on the book of Revelation. I come to you on behalf of the pastor and the membership of New Life Ministries and Church in Plato, Missouri. And I come to you in the name of the Lord to share with you what I believe God has placed on my heart to share with the body of Christ during these last days. And I truly believe that we are living in the last days, um, kind of in a uh, metaphorical sense, I guess we could say that we, um, we've been living in the last days ever since our Lord and Savior ascended uh, from the Mount of Olives after his resurrection. And each of us, and each generation since, has been in the last days in the sense that uh, when death has come, that's your last day here in this life. But that's not what we're talking about um, today. We're talking about the last days before the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to take over this earth and start his millennial reign. Before we get into the lesson today, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, we love you today, and we thank you for who you are. For you are God all by yourself. You're the true and the living God. There is no other but you. And we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise that is due only to you. For you alone are worthy to receive glory, honor, and praise. We were all created by you, and we were created for your pleasure. And, Father, we just ask that you would anoint these lips of clay of mine, that I might be an oracle of your word and of your will. Open the eyes of our revelation to know your will, your word, and your truth, and your truth alone. We ask this in Jesus' sweet name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. We find this same uh, semblance if we go to the book of Ezekiel. Now understand, as we said before in, in starting this study, that all revelation, everything that has been revealed, has been revealed, whether in part or in whole, but it all has been revealed through Jesus Christ. He is the one that God gave the revelation of what was going to happen and what is happening and what will happen and what has happened. He is the one that has given the revelation. And so when we look in the Old Testament and we see the prophets prophesying about different things that were to come, they were given it in a partial manner. Ezekiel had a part. Isaiah had a part. Micah had a part, Obadiah had a part, and so on and so forth. But Jesus Christ has the fullness. The scripture tells us in the, uh, <clears throat> tells us that, uh, Behold, I come in the volume of the book to do thy will. In other words, everything was full in Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul tells us in Colossians, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. So therefore, uh, the Godhead represented uh, the, the fullness of God, which means that all knowledge, all revelation, <clears throat> all understanding, all wisdom uh, is in God. And so therefore, since the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily, all of the revelation, all of the, the knowledge, all of the uh, wisdom, uh, was in Christ Jesus. So we see this in Ezekiel. <clears throat> he is given a rod uh, or a reed to measure also uh, the temple. And so let's look at this. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. <clears throat> but the court which is without the temple leave out. In other words, don't measure that. And measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And this is a twofold thing. The forty and two months <coughs> um, is 
uh, three and a half years. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So we're talking about the latter three and a half years of the um, of the tribulation period. However, we also see when he said, "Measure not that that is without." We're talking about the Gentiles given to the Gentiles. That's an undetermined amount of time also. He didn't measure how, how long the Gentiles were going to be before the tribulation period. Uh, and we, we have seen ever since the temple was destroyed in A.D., the second temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. Uh, primarily the Gentiles have controlled those things up until uh, A.D. Uh, 1967. During the Six Day War, it was when Israel uh, recaptured uh, all of Jerusalem, not just the, uh, the the western part of Jerusalem, but they captured East Jerusalem, where the Temple Mount is located. And so, for the first time in 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years, uh, the Jews had control of the Temple area. And even though they have control, they have not rebuilt the temple because there was a mosque that was placed there. Uh, what we call the Dome of the Rock is placed there. So, uh, <clears throat> so, and so and when, we, when we look at those issues and all, there will be another temple built. The Bible has said it. And just as everything that has happened up to this point has been uh, exactly the way the word of prophecy has, has spoken, uh, we know from the track record that God has spoken and he never lies. We know that the third temple is going to be built. But when that third temple is built at the uh, uh, granting, so to speak, of a covenant between the Antichrist and the, uh, the Jewish state of Israel, uh, when that is done, it's a seven-year covenant. And in the middle of the seven years, the Antichrist is going to break that covenant. And he's going to walk into the temple himself and declare himself as God. And we're going to, we, we see that that goes back to Daniel when he talks about the desolation of, uh, <coughs> of abomination. Uh, we see that happened already before in the sense of Antiochus Epiphanes, who, uh, before uh, during the uh, uh, before the Maccabean revolt, uh, he had a priest do a uh, uh, a sacrifice of a pig on the altar before the temple. And Judas Maccabee went up, and him and his brothers. That's where the revolt started, and all. And they went up and they slew him. He and his family. Uh, they slew the priests and, and all those that were, were, were doing the, the, the uh, desecration and all. Um, and so we see that happen before, and he is the type, so to speak, or the prototype, we could say, of the Antichrist because he was against uh, the rule of God's law and, 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 and therefore resisted God and put himself up and he, what he wanted to do as being... Uh, what they had to worship. And the Antichrist, the, the true Antichrist <clears throat> that the scriptures talk about that's coming, the man of sin, the man of perdition. There's only, there are many, the spirit of Antichrist is out in the world. It's always been out. And anti means, when we look at that, uh, some, in our English language, we look at it as being against Christ. And and it is in, our, in the way that we use it. But in the uh, the Greek language, the uh, Antichrist, it means uh, to put before, to to uh, uh, to have the preeminence. So if you if you're the Antichrist, that means that you're putting yourself in the place of Christ. You are, are putting yourself before Christ and ahead of Him. Uh, uh, just a note from our own uh, American history: uh, if you notice, there's a period of time. When you're dividing before the Civil War and after the Civil War, they call the South the antebellum South. Antebellum meaning before the war. That was Greek for before the war. So, <clears throat> so this is just a little 
tidbit that we're throwing in here to get to give you a, a better uh, grasp and, and a clarification of how things are laid out. So, uh, there's a, as we said before, there's an undetermined or interdeterminate amount of time between the destruction of Jerusalem and, and as John was talking to the seven churches of Asia Minor <coughs> between the, the time of the of, of Christ <coughs> before before the destruction of Jerusalem AD seventy, between the time that Christ was crucified, from that time up until his his return, uh second coming, there's an in, in an undetermined amount of time. Uh also uh just to kind of give you a better clarification of how prophecy works and how this uh Daniel was given seventy weeks. He told it would be seventy weeks before everything would be fulfilled. Well, the first sixty-nine weeks, he said, that would be sixty-nine weeks from the uh, the finishing of the building of the wall in Jerusalem, because the wall would be built in trouble, uh, troubling times. And we know it was troubling time because this is where we get that great statement from jo from uh, Nehemiah. Where they wanted San Ballad and Tobias and I wanted him to come and meet them, and he said, uh, <clears throat> "I can't. I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. I got to get this wall uh, finished, so to speak." And so, uh, from the completion of that until the cutting off of the the Messiah would be 69 weeks. And if you, if we count from the time that they finished, the, the last commandment went out to finish the wall that uh, was put out by uh, the Persian king uh, during the time of Nehemiah, when he told Nehemiah to go and, and take care of Jerusalem. From that time until when Christ was crucified, you have exactly the uh, 69 weeks determined by years, every day for a year. So, uh, at the end of that 69th week was when the Messiah would be cut off, in other words, when Christ would die. And at the end of that, from that time until uh, the, the beginning of the 70th week, which would be the beginning of the seven years of tribulation. Seven years is not the great tribulation. The great tribulation is the last three and a half years of that seven years. But in between that amount of time, is when the church was brought in. And the church was a mystery to the Old Testament prophets. It was a mystery. But yet, it's there in the Old Testament because the semblances of it. Paul tells us that uh, <clears throat> these things uh, happen to the Israelites uh, for our admonition upon whom the end of the world would come. And he also let us know that they were a shadow of the things to come, meaning they were the prototype. Uh, the things you see in the Old Testament, the promised land, the uh, uh, the judging of the of the Canaanites, uh, Goliath, all of these things happening, all of these uh, David, all of these things happening was a prototype of what is to come. And so, <clears throat> when we look at at the uh, uh, at how the scripture is laid out to us uh, of what was to come. The second coming of Christ is not the rapture. The second coming of Christ is when he comes in judgment. It's called the day of the Lord. That's when he will come. And everybody will see him. Everybody's not going to see him at the rapture. But everybody will see him at the second coming. And in the scripture it plainly says that at his second coming, when he comes, we will be with him. Well, we can't be with him if we're still down here. But we will be coming with him. Uh, we'll deal with that. Okay. So he measured out. <coughs> Let me say this before I go further also. I uh, hope I haven't confused you uh, too much. But when we're talking about time, just something that we are familiar with. I remember when I first saw my, my first uh, <coughs> football game and I saw that uh, the clock was saying, you know, it's supposed to be an hour to play the game. That's how much is uh, that's how much is allotted to the uh, to the game to to the play of the game. 
However, we all know that it's normally longer than an hour that they play because they have timeouts and things like that. So <clears throat> I saw they were talking about uh, how much time they had left in the game and everything, and I'm seeing how much time has passed, and I'm saying, wait a minute, uh, it's, they're saying they only have this amount of time in the game, but look how much this his past was going to, and I was, it was explained to me, and I came to understand that you have what you call the official time, and then you have the unofficial time. Now, the unofficial time is all of the times that, that's the actual time that's passing, but <clears throat> it is all of the time that includes the uh, timeouts when they stop the clock, because they'll stop the clock. Uh, when a timeout is called, they'll stop the clock when a play is done. Uh, and so that's, a, that's the official time. Uh, in other words, the time of actual play that's counted. So likewise, uh, in between the, uh, uh, the, the ascension of Christ until his return or, or until the, uh, uh, the 70th week starts, God stopped the clock. At the beginning of the, of the tribulation period, he starts the clock back up, the official time clock. And also right now, the clock is stopped as far as the official time of prophecy, but it's not stopped as far as actual time of what we're living, of the ages and the eras. Okay. Verse 2, but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months, three and a half years. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, that they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. A thousand two hundred and threescore days. So, that's uh, 1,260 uh, days. Now, <clears throat> when he says, I will give uh, power unto my two witnesses. In the King James Version, it's translated with it, it, that's put in there. If you notice, though, in the King James Version, power is italicized. That means it wasn't in the original text. Uh, they added it for clarification. But in actuality, if we read it, and I will give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Now, sackcloth was always a sign of mourning or a sign of judgment. Uh, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. Now, we go back to, this is in reference also back to Zechariah, the, the prophet Zechariah, when he prophesied. Um, and he, the angel was showing him things that were to come, and he saw these uh, two olive trees, and they, he was asked about them. Do you know what they were? They represented Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest. Um, so Zerubbabel was uh, one who uh, was uh, in authority as the, as the governor, so to speak, of, uh, of Judea under the Persian rule. And Joshua was a high priest. So one represented uh, rulership or royalty. The other represented uh, the worship and the uh, uh, priesthood. Which is another reference to the... Uh, to Israel, not the church, but to Israel. Uh, and as we said before, this is what I believe. Now there are others that have other other uh, stands, and uh, I don't uh, uh, condemn them for having those stands uh, because they believe what they believe. Uh, and I want to say that uh, none of us are holding the flashlight, so uh, we're still <coughs> seeking guidance from the Lord, and he will show us what, what's going to actually happen when things actually happen. We'll see exactly what is going on. But 
that those that believe that the rapture has not happened yet and that the church is still here, you know, be that as it may, uh, I believe that, that the church will go through a type of tribulation, but I do not believe the church will go through the great tribulation. That's me. I don't believe that from what my understanding of the scriptures are, and I can only go by what I've been made to understand until the Lord changes my understanding. That's the stance that I have. Um, and Daniel talks about these things, but he talks to Daniel, uh, the, the, the angel talks to Daniel about his people, which Daniel's people were the Jewish people. It was not the church, but the Jewish people. And so he is talking to him about what is going to happen to his people in the last days. Um, and so I believe that at this point, if we go back to... Um, book of Romans, as Paul is, is, uh, is uh, talking to us, um, Paul lets us know <laughs> the uh, Let's go to Romans 11, chapter, and we read the 17th verse. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, he's talking to the uh, to the church here, uh, letting them know, and warning them, admonishing them, not to get so caught up in themselves, thinking that they are so special that um, God has cast off Israel as his people, as some people teach now. This is not the case. God has not called, cast off the Jews as his people uh, and replaced them with the church. Those are two separate entities for two separate purposes. Okay. He used the Jews to bring the Gentiles into the church. Peter was Jewish. Paul was Jewish. And all the apostles were Jewish. And the early church the leaders and elders of the early church, the majority of them were Jewish. So he brought them in. Um, and then he, uh, <clears throat> they were, they, uh, it became more Gentilist as time went on. Um, and then in the latter days, he's going to bring the Jews back in after the church has been raptured. That's my belief. Um, but he says, and if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. The, the, the root is one root, and that's all of that is caught up in Christ. Both the Jews and the Gentiles, all of that is caught up in Christ. And Paul tells us in Ephesians that he makes out of two one new man. Okay. Boast not against the branches, but in other words, the branches that were taken out. But if thou boastest, thou bearest not the root, but the root bearest thee. Okay? Thou would say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, talking about the Jews, Take heed, lest he also spare not thee. But therefore, I mean, behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, in other words, if they change, which they are going to, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. He talks about over and over about a remnant that would be saved. Talking of Israel. Okay. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be not be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Jesus says the same thing 
to the woman by the well in Samaria, and he lets them know. He said, now you worship what you don't know not, but we uh, salvation is given unto the Jews. And he was letting them know, this is where it starts. And Paul comes back and tells us the same thing, that the Jews were the ones that were given the knowledge of the true and living God. And it is through him that the rest of the world is blessed. And it, through them, the rest of the world is blessed. Who wrote the scriptures of the Old Testament? It was Jews that wrote, wrote them. Israelites that wrote them. And that's where our New Testament, who wrote the New Testament? Jews. And that's where it came from. That's where we look at the basis, the root of the tree. Verse 25, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that which was hidden before, lest ye should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Until the fullness of God working with the Gentiles is done, Israel is made blind. And we see the lifting of that veil being done starting in 1967. That's when you start had the start, actually, of the Messianic Jews, Jewish movement coming in. And so all Israel shall be there shall When God to anyone, but at this point, is but it's all of this will happen at the time that the Antichrist steps in to the uh, temple to present himself as God. Verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, that word election again, uh, election is a, is a choice made by those who are empowered. Everybody is not empowered. Everybody is not a legitimate voter, so to speak. But those that are empowered to choose, that's where the election comes in. And the only one that's empowered to choose as far as election is concerned is God. He is the one that chooses. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. In other words, because of the covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, <clears throat> and the covenant that he made through Moses and also through David, uh, the Jews will be brought in. There will be a portion of them, a remnant that will be saved. That's why we go back to reason the 144,000 were sealed because they will be the ones, the remnant that God uses not only as saving, but also using them through them to bring the Gentiles, of the Gentiles in during the tribulation period. <clears throat> Verse 29, for the gifts, and I don't have time to deal with all of this, this is so rich, for the gifts and calling of God, I'll have to do a different video cast on this, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Once God, once God, makes a choice. He doesn't go he doesn't turn back on it. It's done. <clears throat> it's immutable. And Hebrews chapter six tells us about that. <clears throat> I mean, I'm I'm not gonna I'm gonna get back to to Revelation. Uh, finish this up. Uh, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth <coughs> the enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, there is uh, those who believe that these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah because of, of the, uh, the manifestation on the Mount of Transfiguration when Moses and Elijah appeared. We find that in Luke 
in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, it says that they appeared and spoke with Jesus regarding his uh, crucifixion that was coming up, his his, his death. You know. <clears throat> but we know from the book of Deuteronomy that Moses died. Now there are those that believe that Moses was resurrected. And this is what Jude is talking about when uh, Michael and, and, and Satan or the devil are disputing over the body of Moses. Um, <clears throat> so that Moses could appear with Elijah at the Mount of, on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, I'm just giving you what is out there, what's, what's being uh, some people believe in, in the talk. Uh, then there are others believe that these two witnesses are Elijah and, e and Enoch, because these are the two that have not died. Now, we know with the uh, with Elijah, Elijah was a prophet that was known for calling down fire from heaven upon his enemies. So that would fit here with Elijah. However, and he, he did not die, but they are to be killed. So we see why he was reserved, why he could, we could see why he would be reserved for this moment in time. Um, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not. This is another thing that we saw with Elisha. He prayed and, and it didn't rain for a space of uh, three and a half years, which coincides with uh, the first half of the tribulation period, three and a half years. These uh, uh, and also the amount of time that they are prophesying three and a half years. These have power to shut up heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. And this is why others believe that it was Moses that was with Elijah uh, because we look at the plagues of Egypt for Moses was the one that was uh, uh, was being used by God to bring this upon Egypt. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Notice it's the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit. We talked about previously about the uh, <clears throat> the locusts coming up out of the bottom of the pit, and then there was a uh, a ruler of them that came up out of the bottom of this pit. And these locusts also were uh, uh, equipped as, so to speak, as warriors uh, that they attacked humankind. And it was an army that's been described. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. He's talking about Jerusalem. So this ties in. These are Jews. This is a Jewish thing. And, it's, and that's why he talks about the temple. He talks about the court of the Gentiles, which is at, without the temple. <coughs> um, so all these has a play here. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer the dead bodies to be put in graves. They're not going to suffer. They're not going to permit them to be buried. Now, they're actually under the control of God because God doesn't want them to be buried, which we shall see in this next verse. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. Remember that back in the fourth chapter of Revelation, where John heard a voice coming from heaven saying, Come up here. Here he is again. Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. And their enemies beheld them. Now, I, I want to reiterate to you that over the years, uh, I've read a lot of uh, books regarding Revelation and commentaries and all. And I and I was uh, in a lot, 
I've heard a lot of ministries explaining this and all. And uh, and so a lot of things that I thought I was uh, settled in, uh, going through this again this time, uh, as well as the last time, the Lord opened up things to me that I had not seen before. And some of this is because of the timing. Some things were, as, as God told uh, Daniel through the angel, Gabriel, that uh, to seal it up until the time of the end. There are some things that will not be revealed or will not be apparent to us or clarified to us until the timing. And we're living in a day and time when things are happening so fast according to what has been prophesied in the scripture. Now, one thing I want to reiterate to you, as far as the, the Messiah is concerned, as far as all the things that must happen before the rapture comes, not talking about the second coming of Christ, but the rapture comes of the church. Uh, all of the prophecies have been fulfilled. There are none to be fulfilled anymore. So it could happen at any moment. But I also want to reiterate to you that those of you that are some that are uh, uh, studying for prophecy and, and trying to keep track of prophecy and, and different things that's happening and you're watching the news and all and trying to fit that into prophecy and stuff. If you have not started a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you do not have him as your Lord and Savior, you'll be like someone studying the bus schedule and haven't bought a ticket. And when the bus arrives, you don't have a ticket, and it goes, and you're left standing there at the bus stop without a ticket. You knew the schedule. You had that down pat. You knew which bus was to come. You had that down pat. But you didn't do that extra step of getting it right. Now, I'm saying to you, uh, irrespective, we can, we can disagree on what all of this means as far as the uh, uh, tribulation period, as far as the rapture as far as the second coming of Christ, we can disagree on all that. We might not see all of that, but one thing we cannot disagree on and be, and be right, and that is we cannot disagree on the fact of the need for us to be saved. If you're not saved, you're guaranteed you're not going to go with the Lord. If you're not saved, you're guaranteed that you will not have your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's a guarantee if you're not saved. There's no, no question about that. So if you have not made that covenant with Jesus Christ, and if you, if you don't do that, you will not uh, be uh, judged worthy to be with him for eternity. But you will be judged to be cast into the lake of fire. That's, that's just the fact. Those are the facts. So... Uh, regardless of whether you agree with what I've shared as far as as far as the timetable of things happening and all, one thing that I need to reiterate to you, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're on dangerous ground. You're in a dangerous position because the rapture might not come for another 10, 100, or whatever years. But if you're called in, to the presence of the Lord tonight. It doesn't matter about the rapture. It doesn't matter about uh, the second coming. If you call into his presence tonight and you have not accepted him as your Lord and Savior, it's done for you. It's over. So I urge you, I exhort you, as Paul says in many of his letters, that you would ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and to come into your life as your Lord and your Savior, and he will do it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the scripture tells us that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will not be ashamed. You won't be made ashamed. You won't be left hanging, but he will save you. Let me say this, verse 12 again. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, 
and had an earthquake before. That was never, like nothing had ever happened before. Well, here's another great earthquake. There's a lot of things going to be happening in the elements and in the climate. A lot of things are going to be happening where God is showing his authority over the climate, his authority over the elements of creation, his authority over the heavens. God is in control, not us, not us. God is in control. And the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, previously when they had all this that was happening uh, with the with the locusts that was was stinging men, and 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 they were looking for death, but but could not find death, and they were suffering. But it said they blasphemed God. They didn't repent. But here they are glorifying the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel, look, you only have three and a half years to get this wrapped up. So things are going to be happening in rapid events. Get ready. Now, something else I want to uh, put, want you to put a pen in, and that's this. In, this, in the book of Revelation, Everything is not in the chronological order in the sense uh, like we look at from the Western or Occidental standpoint. We look at things going in a straight line. But from the Oriental standpoint, it's not linear, but it is circular. It is spherical, uh, meaning upon the sphere or the circle, in that uh, you can have something that, that will appear for, uh, that happened uh, yesterday, and then go from yesterday to tomorrow, and then go from tomorrow to today. So always keep that in mind with this with this book of Revelation. And, and uh, I don't remember if I I made that point earlier in the series, but I'm making it now, so that you know that things are, are fluid. I did make that point earlier that the, that the timeline is fluid in the book of Revelation. So there are things that that we're going to get ready to get into that. Uh, happen before. They're not happening. Uh, they're happening right then before John because he is observing from heaven standpoint. So things are happening right then and there of the vision that he's given of what is what is going to happen uh, in the future. However, uh, the things that he is seeing, some of those things have already happened. And some of the things are going to happen. And, and some of the things are happening right at the moment. So just keep that in mind to be, be fluid. Okay. And the seventh angel sounded. So here we go with the seventh. All the other angels have sounded the trumpets. The six trumpets have been sounded. Now this is the seventh trumpet. And the seventh angel is sounding. And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world, listen to this, are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. At that moment... Everything that is up until this point, you've got to understand, everything has been ordained of God the Father and has been set up. Both the good and the bad, all of this, nothing can happen without God's permission. And as I shared with y'all before about some things happening uh, with Ahab and, and the spirit that came up and how God has control even over the devil. The devil has to do, when God says do, the devil even has to uh, uh, obey. And the scripture tells us, even dealing with, with uh, mortal men, it says, he'll make even your enemies. If a man's ways please God, he'll make even his enemies be at peace with you. They might, want, they might not want to be at peace, but they'll have to be at peace with you. We see the same thing acted out in the book of Esther, where Haman was made to go before Mordecai and give Mordecai glory and give Mordecai uh, praise because of what he had done in pleasing the uh, the king. And Haman had been plotting to kill more. He wanted to kill all the Jews, and he had plotted to do that. And all. that's what he hated the Jews. And if you want to know Haman's, uh, uh, his um, heritage, uh, he was part of the Amalekites who hated the people of God. And we know how Haman ended up if you read the book of Esther. Anyway, let's get back to this. 
Um, and the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his covenant, of his testament. And there was lightings and voices and thunders and an earthquake and great hail. Now there are those that that uh, I'm going to say this and I'm regressing a little bit. Those that that teach and believe that uh, if we escape the wrath, if we go to uh, we're raptured, that we escape uh, any kind of tribulation or any kind of persecution or any kind of uh, uh, tribulation. That's not what the scripture teaches. Scripture doesn't teach that. The scripture teaches that we will be raptured. We will be raptured in time. We will be raptured in the right moment so that we will not go through the great tribulation. That's the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. So the rapture can happen any time before or any time up to that uh, three and a half years, the middle of the tribulation period. Uh, all of that can happen. So I just want to reiterate that. And why am I reiterating that right now? Because if we go back, uh, we see that some churches, one church in particular, was promised that they would escape the trial. That's the Church of Philadelphia. They would escape the trial of uh, that was going to come upon the earth and all. But I'm reiterating this because of the fact that uh, if we don't tell you to be prepared to die for the Lord Jesus Christ, the Scripture talks about it that they love not their lives even unto the death. And if you're loving your life, and Jesus tells us, he that seeks to save his life shall lose it, but he that loses his life for my name's sake shall be saved. So regardless of what happens, regardless of whether you go through the tribulation or, or have to go through the tribulation or whether you, uh, and, and then are raptured or whether you, uh, are raptured before you go into the tribulation. The fact of the matter is, are you willing to live for Christ and willing to give your life for him if it comes to that? You need to be prepared for that. Jesus said, don't fear him who is able to kill only the body, but fear him rather who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. So I'm, I'm reiterating to you, Make sure, make your election and call in sure, but make sure that you have given your life to Christ and that you are willing to do whatever he is asking of you to do. Because we have the example in the times past, in the first century, we have the example of the saints going to their death with songs and praises on their lips that they were found worthy to die for us as a witness to Jesus Christ. Are you? If you're not, then you better check yourself because you need to love him more than you love your own life. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and the voices and thunders and an earthquake and great hail. This is all on falling on the earth. So we need to take inventory before we stand here as we go through this. The, I'm going to say this again. Uh, there are some people that say all you know, Revelation is full of symbols, and it is. It's full of symbols, symbolic things. Some things are literal and some things are symbolic. But one thing is for, for sure, Revelation is true. It's the truth. It's going to happen. It is going to happen. Regardless of whether you're ready or not, it's going to happen. He's coming. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And none of us are perfect of ourselves. And I confess to you, first of all, I'm not perfect. I fail. 
in a lot of areas. Uh, things that I desire to do, I'm like Paul in Romans 7 chapter, uh, I do not. And the things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. You know, but I know this. I don't stay in the 7th chapter. I know this. I got to go to that 8th chapter. There. there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And so I say to you, irrespective of your faults, Irrespective of your shortcomings, irrespective of your failures, irrespective of all that you're going through right now, the trials and the tribulations that you might be experiencing, understand that there is a God that sits high and he looks low. He's on his throne and he is in control of it all. And if he brings you to it, he'll bring you through it. So give him the glory, give him the honor, and give him the praise, irrespective of what's happening in your life. And he is able to to bless you in the midst of your enemies attacking you. God is able to make a table for you that you can sit and you can re, uh, have, a, have a beautiful repast and, and enjoy what he has set before you. God is able to do that and to deliver you out of the hands of all of your enemies and to bring you into a goodly end. He's able to do that. Trust him and give him all of the glory on and the praise that is due his name. Father, I've tried to share with him as best as, as I understand. I can only go with what I understand, not what others understand, but what I understand that you have shown me. And if I have failed in any way to express what your desire is and what you have shown me, forgive me and help me that I might be able to to do better in sharing with them what is remaining of this study and this series. I give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And I thank you, Lord, for your tender mercy and your grace that you've shown us. Keep these your people as out of your eye, withhold not any good thing from them, but bless them with your presence, not as a visitation, but as a habitation. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless your saints until next time. Go with God.